everybody. <clears throat> Welcome back to our look at John's Gospel. We started out a few sessions ago looking at John 1, and I just want to go back there for one minute to refresh our memory about one of the very important verses right in the beginning, because what John puts in the beginning, I keep going back to. Every time I study something, I think, didn't he say that in the beginning? And I go back, and there it is. The part that I wanted to read is when he's talking about the Word. This is in John 1, verse 4. And remember, the Word has a capital W, so it means Jesus. The Word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Here at this Christmas season, it's so much about the light, isn't it? It's a time of the light. We have a gift of the light. That's what John is saying. It's not just the word. It's also the light. And that's going to be important all the way through all the things we read today. So... Remember that he started out that way, talking about the light and the light being so important. Because we have a gift of light from God, and the gift of light is Jesus, who came as a baby in the manger at Christmas. So this his whole message really ties up so much about the Christmas story, even though he doesn't mention Mary. He doesn't mention you know, the shepherds and the angels like, like the other gospel writers do. He's still talking about Jesus coming down to earth as a baby. And the next part we were looking at was, was where Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He's a Pharisee and a, a Jewish leader, religious man, and he, he comes to Jesus at night and Jesus tells him, um, you have to be born again in order to be in my kingdom. And Nicodemus doesn't understand this. And Jesus explains to him that he has to have a spiritual rebirth. That we can't just, uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't anything physical, but that when you come to Jesus, you become a new person spiritually. And that's the born again part. Well, he goes on with one of the most famous verses uh, that we've heard so many times. This is John three sixteen. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. What better Christmas scripture could you read than that one? And again, it doesn't mention the, the manger. It doesn't mention the angels. It doesn't mention the uh the, uh, the, the wise men, you know, but it does mention God sending his son into the world, God becoming man. And he goes on to say to Nicodemus, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact, God's light came into the world. But people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so that others can see what they are doing and what God wants. I couldn't help thinking about light and darkness. And people loved the darkness more than light. You know, what can we do in the darkness? I, I was thinking, you know, we can hide in the darkness. You can hide who you really are. You cannot be genuine or authentic. You can be, uh, mask all your feelings and, and, and hide that way. You can hide when you know you've done something wrong. You know, you hide the truth from people. Um, Denial is actually a, a form of hiding. Uh, refusing to repent or refusing to say you made a mistake, refusing to forgive someone. These are all ways of hiding, really. We're hiding, and, and that's the darkness. Um, even in a way, when, we're, when we focus on the wrong thing, it's a way of hiding. When I focus on how much money I have, you know, it takes my focus off of God. I'm kind of hiding from God, the darkness. A lot of people like 
the darkness. They can do what they want. They don't have to, they don't have to uh, own up to what's going on. The light is honesty. The light is humility. Because I, I was thinking when the light comes on, you realize you are just like everybody else. You know, uh, no better, but no worse. And, and that's part of humility, knowing that God is perfect and I can never be perfect and I'm just like everybody else. So we're all in the same boat. You know, that's, that's, that's the essence of humility is just knowing my place in, in, in humanity. I am loved by God, but I'm not loved any more than anybody else. And that, that humility comes with the light. It's almost like when an idea dawns, you know, it's like the light went on. You know, we think of ideas even as being open to, to uh, you know, the dawning of understanding and versus in the darkness, there's ignorance there's lies, there's cover-up, there's pretense, there's uh, rationalizing and justifying, you know, all those things go along with the darkness so that we can get out of seeing the truth. And that's why Jesus is the truth and the truth sets us free. Jesus sets us free to be honest with him and honest with God and honest with other people. We are who we are. That's it. I'm, I'm made the way God made me to be, you know? Yes, I have my faults, but so does everybody else. And I know that God loves me enough to forgive me and that God sent his son into the world to save all people, not just me, but everybody. Another part of the light dawning. You know, there's there's a verse in Isaiah that's often uh, quoted at Christmas time that ties in with this. It's Isaiah 9 and it is Isaiah's prophecy about Jesus. This starts in verse 2. And notice how it starts. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Okay, so the prophet Isaiah is foretelling this. John is referring to it. Jesus is referring to it when he says to Nicodemus, you know, people don't like the light. They want to. This is exactly what Isaiah was saying. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. That's Jesus. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. What's the yoke that burdens us? You know, what's the bar across your shoulder? What's the rod of your oppressor? I know what my yokes are and what they've been in the past and how Jesus has helped me to shatter those. You know, when we when we have no self-esteem, that's a yoke. That burdens us. That's, that's a bar across your shoulder making you, you know, lean over when you don't think you're worthwhile. Um, when you have guilt and shame, that you've never been able to let go of. You know, when someone told you uh, a long time ago that you were a waste of time and you bought into it, you know, these, these are all yokes that burden us. May, might be our upbringing, might be something, you know, your mother or your father did to you or talked, you know, taught you or something, some way that they led life that was unhealthy. All kinds of things that can be yokes and burdens. I, I know I've had a a ton of them in my life and some of them were of my own making of course you can get yourself into a lot of trouble you can get yourself into a position where you're burdened and you don't know where to turn um and sometimes it was simply the world you know that we live in a fallen world sometimes it was sickness or something that happened with my kids or there's a lot of bars across our shoulders and when jesus comes he shatters that he shatters it. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning. Okay? All the things that were nasty are burned when we put them to Jesus, when we give them to him. And look at why. This is verse 6. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
very, very important words that Isaiah gives telling us a baby will come and he will be the savior. He will be the one that breaks the yoke. He will be the great light that the people in darkness have seen. So he, Isaiah says it, John says it in the beginning of his gospel, and now Jesus says it to Nicodemus. He says, "There's a, I'm the light, I'm here. I'm here to break everything, and people are preferring the darkness to the light. They don't want to come into the light. You know, uh, it, it, it's a it's an interesting thing that Christ's birth and that light of his birth was reflected in the angels, the glory of the angels, you know, that came around, and it's reflected in the light uh, of the star is another symbol of that light that came into the world. Um and all of those things of light, I can't help thinking that they point to the cross. Because even as Jesus said to Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent the son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. So this birth of Jesus in the manger is all about salvation. It's all about the light, like a beacon pointing to the cross. I just love that. I just love it. I think it's so great. As this chapter continues, um, there's more about John the Baptist and what a guy he was. I mean, look how he brings in the notion of light. This is verse 22 of John 3. Then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went to the Judean countryside, and Jesus spent some time with them there, baptizing people. At this time, John the Baptist was baptizing near Salim, because there was plenty of water there, and the people kept coming to him for baptism. This was before John was thrown into prison. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as Messiah, he's also baptizing people and everybody's going to him instead of coming to us. Okay, this is a natural darkness here that they think they should be jealous of this. They think John ought to do something. Bring these people back to us, you know. You're losing people here. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you I'm not the Messiah. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It's the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. It's kind of like John the Baptist is saying, Christ is the bridegroom, the church is his bride, and I'm the best man. <laughs> That's basically what he's saying. He's just going to be there to get things ready, you know, hold the ring, that kind of stuff. He must be greater and greater, and I must become less and less. Look at the humility there and look at the light, that openness, that willingness and humility of just saying, I've done my part. Now it's him. Verse 31, he has come from above. It is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but few believe what he tells them. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true, for he is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God gives him the Spirit without limit. The Father loves his Son and has put everything into his hand, and anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. John says, if you're drawn to that light, you go. I'm not going to get bigger and bigger. He's going to get greater and greater. I'm going to get less and less because he is the light of the world, not me. He wants his disciples and to know that he's okay with them because they want light. They're looking for something. Did you ever know a seeker like that? I was thinking, you know, this is what people are People are looking for something authentic, something real, you know, something um, not just religion, you know, uh, where they've maybe always gone to the same church and said the same words. 
And, and there's something comforting about that. I'm not putting that down in any way, but many people have always had that up here and have never had it touch their hearts. And so they, they, they're still in darkness. They don't see the light and they're searching. So they search in a lot of different ways, you know, looking for the light when the light is right there, right there where they always were, you know, it's in Jesus. And, um, we get caught up sometimes with the familiarity and, and rote kinds of worship. And we don't, we don't see Jesus. We don't see the light, you know, and, and when the light dawns, it's like, whoa, I get it now. You know, that there are a lot of people in this world seeking and people are seeking in the wrong direction. Sometimes they're seeking their validation and their light in, uh, I don't know, relationships or work or money or so many different ways, you know, drugs, it, it doesn't matter. People are seeking. They want fulfillment. They want to know they matter. They want to know they're loved. And Jesus is saying, this is what I'm here for. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son into the world. I, I, I think that this very, very familiar message of God so loved the world it is a Christmas, it's a Christmas verse, even though we Maybe don't always think of it that way, you know. We, we don't think of it maybe as a Christmas verse. It really is because it tells exactly what motivated God the Father to send his son, which was simply love, just love. There are so many different, um, different uh, Christmas carols that talk about the light, many of them. But, of course, the one that is most familiar, I think, to most people and most uh, touching to most people is Silent Night. Because most of us, if you've gone to any church on Christmas ever, most of us can remember a moment of candles on the altar, electric lights pushed down low, everybody holding a candle maybe, or candles in sconces on the walls and on the, uh, on the alley, you know, the aisles and greenery, and, and beauty, and this peace that settles down on people when they hear these, this simple carol. And there's so much about light in Silent Night. The Silent Night is a dark place. It's, it's a quiet darkness, nighttime. However, there's light in the song, and the light is from Jesus. And, you know, in verse verse 1, really doesn't talk that much about it, but it does say all is calm, all is bright. Where's the brightness coming from? It's coming from the manger. It's coming from Jesus, because he's the light. And the second verse talks about the glories that stream from heaven afar, you know, that bright light of the angels coming down and saying, the light of the world is born. Go, shepherds, go and see this manger, you know. And then the last verse really sums it up. It says, silent night, holy night, son of God loves pure light. Radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace. This is God's light in a manger. And it's pointing to the dawn of redeeming grace, which is the cross. It, this hymn, I can see why it touches everyone because it's just simple and it's like a little ray of light in the darkness. Just a little ray of light um, that says, Jesus is here, even in your darkness, even in your sorrow, even in your grief even in your poor self-esteem, even in everything that makes your life seem dark, Jesus is the light. What better Christmas message could we have? What more could get us in the mood, you know, for Christmas? So, uh, you might want to, you might want to sing along, even at home. Close your door so no one will hear you, you know? I always sing to myself. I think it's kind of fun, and sometimes it warms my heart, and it brings me closer to God. So you could join me. 
Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace, silent night, holy night, shepherds quake at the sight glory stream from heaven afar heavenly hosts sing alleluia Christ the Savior is born Christ the Savior is Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face, with the dawn of redeeming. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. I, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this little Christmas message from John. As I read the scripture, I always like to try to bring it into whatever's happening in my life right then. And uh, all scripture connects some way or another because it's all God's story. Uh, so I'd like to wish you all a Merry Christmas. I probably won't be doing another video for a while because uh, most of you know I'm going to be traveling right after Christmas. I'm going to be going to my daughter's house, which is great. And then uh, from there we're going south so I probably will not get a chance to do another video maybe between Christmas and New Year's I could find a chance to do one but more likely it'll be after the first of the year so um, if I don't see you or talk to you again have a wonderful Christmas and a very joyous New Year see you in 2021 bye